All right, happy Sabbath. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Tashana um, and this ministry is called Daughters of God. Um, it's specifically for women. Um, so um, at this time, we will just pray to open and then um, I'll give you a short introduction into what we what we intend to do um, and then introduce Pastor Lightboard or ask Pastor Lightboard to introduce himself. So, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy Sabbath day. Lord, we are grateful that we have a time to rest and to um, come away from the cares of this world and turn our eyes to Jesus. Lord, at this time, um, we will be talking about overcoming past hurts. I pray and ask that your Holy Spirit will lead and that whoever you've laid on their hearts to come, that they will be here in a timely manner so that they can get the full um, presentation um, that will no doubt change their hearts. Heavenly Father, um, we give this into your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, Daughters of God, um, I'll put the link in, um, is aim for women, um, mainly in the UK, but it's extended to, to others as well. Um, for the purpose, let's try and mute. Okay, so it's aimed for women in the UK for the per for that purpose, and the reason is, is because I did see a ministry that is taking place in America that was very, very inspirational. That I've decided that it would be good for us to have one aimed at young women, um, or women in general in the UK. Um, what we try to do on is on a weekly basis, we do a Daughters of God reading with interchanging with presentation on relevant topics. Um, yeah, relevant topics for, for, for the audience, that is. Um, so tonight or this evening, we have Pastor Liburd, who is the family, um, family life. Would you call it not family life? Family department in the yeah, NEC. Family ministries department. Yeah. Family ministries in um, the NEC department. He's the, the director of that department. Um, and I've listened to a presentation by himself. And I think there are some relevant things that he has brought across that I thought it would be beneficial um, for us. And therefore, that's the reason why. So, Pastor, would you be able to introduce yourself? Um, tell us your name, what you do, and... Yes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul. I am a pastor, but my name is Paul. <laughs> and um, I grew up in a family of eight children in England, in Manchester. And as I grew up, I experienced many terrible and traumatic things. Um, some of which I, I might share. And um, over my life, I have gone through many journeys in an attempt to overcome pain and m move on from the past. Part of my journey has, has led me to also study counseling at some stage in my life. And at the moment, I'm working, in addition to as a pastor, I'm one of the volunteers for the NEC counseling service as one of the counselors who volunteers with them. And my journey of finding um, help for myself has led me to find help for other people. And I've often thought of myself as somebody who likes to relieve pain. You know, like in the medical profession, you have the anesthetist, their job is to give you anesthetics so that the operations will be less painful. But I, I am more interested in emotional pain 
Because very often when we talk about pain, we give physical pain the highest priority. And sometimes our emotional pain is worse than physical pain. And because it is less understood or less easily diagnosed, it goes untreated for a longer period of time. Um, so this evening, what I want to do is I'll just talk a little bit about overcoming past hurts in, in general. And I'm hoping by the time I've spoken for a short while, you may want to ask some questions. Yeah. You may either ask them live or um, type them into the chat and Tashana will read them out and then I will address them. Um, because what I say at the beginning is quite general, but if you ask questions or, and the questions don't need to be questions about your own life, you might be asking questions about a friend who you are trying to help or something you're just trying to understand. And in that dialogue between us, as we try and answer each other's questions, you will find relevance and something to take away to help someone else. So that is my prayer for this evening. So write your questions down as we go along and um, then we will have a question and answer session. So let's pray to begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here and to speak about past hurts. We pray that you will guide our minds and our conversation. In Jesus' name, amen. I read a quote once, which is, you know, there's lots of quotes on the internet you read, and one popped up on my screen, which resonated with me. It made sense. So I'm going to share it with you. It's by Jean Paul Sartre. Okay, yeah. And it says, freedom is what you do with what's been done to you. Freedom is what you do with what's being done to you. When you unpack that, all of your experiences of your life is what's been done to you. From the time that you were born and all those people who were in charge of your well-being, however they managed or mismanaged their responsibility, you received it, whether good or bad. And that's what's happened to you. Freedom is deciding what to do with it what to do with this bag of experiences, which you call your history. And depending on how you manage that bag of experiences will determine whether you experience freedom or ongoing um, pain or entrapment or servitude to these emotions. So let's look at a couple of principles. One principle that I want to talk about, about when we're talking about the past is, is this. The past is really the present. Now, what do I mean by that? I said, well, no, the past happened a long time ago. So the past is the past. And you are right. But the aspect of the past that hurts us or damages our life is the part of that past experience that we relive in the present. So if something happened to you 20 years ago, and every time you think about it, you get upset, that upset feeling is in the present. You are presently being upset. So what happened is not, is not harming you anymore, but your thoughts about it are now causing you to react in a particular way. Um, so your past is really in the present. All the anger, all the hurt feelings that are triggered when you remember the past, happen now. So when you're trying to heal the past, you're actually trying to heal the present because the past cannot change. It's, it actually happened and it cannot be changed. But what can be changed is what happens to us every time we remember it. Our reactions to that past memory can change. Our understanding of that memory can change. The way we allow it to affect our lives can change. And so when you think about the past, think about now, because the past is what triggers feelings in the present tense. And one of the ways that we, we perpetuate the past is that we continue allowing ourselves to suffer 
in the present. And every time we allow ourselves to suffer, we cause that past pain to be relived in our lives. Emotional pain, for example, it comes in waves like the sea. One minute you feel fine, the next minute it just washes over you and you may feel tearful or upset or vulnerable all over again. Um, you might have anger in the present tense because of abuses that happened. And these anger feelings ambush you unexpectedly and can make you short tempered with people or situations. And it might be because of something in the past, but the anger and the short temperedness is very much a present tense experience. As a result of what happened in the past or the pain that you have suffered, you may have ended up with a low self-worth, especially if you had suffered some kind of abuse from someone who was in charge of looking after your care. And many people, when they have suffered abuse, the abusers lower their self-worth, lower the self-worth of the victims. And the most damaging part of abuse is what you believe about yourself after the abuse has finished. So if after an experience of abuse, you go away believing, I am rubbish, I am worthless, I deserve that, I'll never amount to anything. Those feelings and thoughts are what will ruin your life. And so what you do with those thoughts is crucial if you're thinking about moving on. Things that happen to us in the past leave raw spots. Like if you fall down, <clears throat> and bruise your elbow and it's raw and the skin has come off and the bone is exposed. Anybody who touches your elbow <clears throat> will get a very severe overreaction from you because you will feel an intense amount of pain. And if they do not realize what happened to your elbow, they will not un understand your overreaction. And they will just make some other reason for your overreaction, like you're oversensitive or you you're not right in your head. But really, it's because of the weakness and the sensitivity that has happened. But those raw spots are very much in the present tense. So what can we do to, to help ourselves and to, to process these feelings and start to heal in the present tense? Because it's like glue. You know, sometimes you sometimes I work with glue when I'm working with wood or there's, there's a type of foam called expanding foam, which fills gaps, and it's really, really sticky. And if you allow it to dry on your hands, it can take days to get off. You actually have to wait for your skin to exfoliate naturally for this glue to come off. And sometimes the experiences of the past leave us with such intense, present tense feelings that they become like glue and we simply cannot loosen ourselves from them. And here are some thoughts that cause bad experiences to stick with us. One thought is, I need an apology. Now, if you tell yourself, I'm never going to move on until that person gives me an apology, you have now made yourself a slave to that person. Because what if that person never gives you the apology for the rest of your life? Are you then going to remain in that trap of being upset because they have decided not to apologize to you? So when you, when you put your feelings on hold, waiting for someone else to do something, you then put your life in their hands. The second thing that um, causes um, pain and hurt feelings to stick is if you then tell yourself that it was your fault that you let it happen to you and you deserved it. Because once you start saying that, then you will start believing that other bad things that happen to you, you also deserve them. Another thing that causes pain to stick is when you internalize a false belief about yourself. You know, I shouldn't have let it happen, I was stupid. And then that feeling, I was stupid, is translated to, I am stupid. And that damaging feeling moves through our life, destroying anything we come in contact with. 
another thought that causes pain to remain unhealed is the thought which says, I'm never going to get over this. And if you say to yourself, I am never going to get over this, you are right. Because what you say to yourself becomes your truth. Or if you say to yourself, I will never rest until I get my own back. Until I see with my eyes that they have reaped what they have sowed. You, then you have walked into a trap again. Because God says, vengeance is mine. And sometimes we don't always see the end result of those who have harmed us. Sometimes God will deal with them in another way. And we don't get the pleasure of seeing them fall down and, and suffer like we have suffered. And sometimes in relationships, we, we do this to each other. You know, if, if somebody hurts us and they don't seem to understand how much they have hurt us, then sometimes we feel obliged to explain to them how much they have hurt us. And if they don't seem to understand or get it, then we sometimes want to act it out, do to them what they have done to us, just to make sure that they understand. And that's, that train of thought can, can go so far to the point that we become like them. We do exactly to them what they have done to us in an attempt to make them understand what they did to us. And by the time you've done that, you've both become the same as each other. And this thought, I, I will not rest until I get my own back, is not a thought that causes pain to stick to us. What about healing then? How, how does healing take place? <clears throat> well, it's easy to say, just let go of the past and move on. You know, my mother has this, this saying, which she quotes from the Bible, where the Apostle Paul says, you know, Pressing, I press towards the mark. You know, not looking back at anything that has happened before, I just press forwards. And the Apostle Paul had much pain in his life. And I can well imagine why he wouldn't want to look back, because he did some terrible things to families and persecuted people and put them in prison. And so looking back was a very painful experience for him. But forcing ourselves to forget something is trying to do something that is impossible. So if you have been hurt by an experience in the past, then don't say to yourself, I must try and forget this ever happened because the brain cannot forget what you have remembered. So for example, if I say, I'm going to forget the time that my friend beat me up and recorded me on YouTube. Suppose that happened to me. Well, first of all, I've got to remember what it is I'm trying to forget. And by the time I have remembered what I have decided to forget, I've already remembered it and I can't forget it anymore. So don't fall into the trap of trying to forget things because your mind is not designed to make you forget them. Things that you think you have forgotten are still there because all that needs to happen is a familiar experience happens and you remember I've been there before. So don't try the impossible and, and try and force your mind to forget something that is already on your mind. Or don't try and ignore your feelings because that simply creates another set of problems which will lead you to addictive behaviors because those feelings which you try to ignore will just go deeper inside you and cause more and more and more pain. And then Addictive behaviors is a way of escaping from the pain. And many people have addictive habits and they don't know why they have such addictive habits. But one of the reasons why they are so addicted to things is because they have deep pain that they're trying to ignore. And there are different levels of addictions from you know, overeating, you know, food addictions, overspending, you know, the retail therapy, Sex is an addiction, alcohol, smoking, different types of drugs is addiction. There are many escapist habits that we do. And sometimes we don't understand what drives us. But if we stop and think, 
what it is we are trying to get away from or overcome or compensate for, we may realize that it, it is pain that we are trying to ignore. And when you try to ignore pain, it slows your whole mind down. Because now a good section of your mind, suppose you know 40% of your mind is constantly used up, blocking bad thoughts, then that means you only have 60% of your mind available to do any living. It's like having a, a computer where you know, the, the RAM, you know, the random access memory is so full, it can't even open a program properly. So don't try and just ignore your feelings. You know, don't hijack yourself by putting your life on hold while you wait for an apology or you wait for someone to acknowledge what they have done. Because that simply postpones your happiness until they are ready to give it to you. And what if they never choose to do that? Then you will never find happiness again. Or sometimes you say, well, I'll just wait for time to heal the wound and I'll just do nothing. And sometimes the past pain does dull a little, but time alone is not sufficient to create healing. Because if you just wait, you might think that everything is okay until a similar situation happens and all the feelings come back as if they happened yesterday. Um, don't wallow endlessly in your emotions. Like some people, um, because of the pain that they have gone through, they, they make pain their best friend. So they, they hide away from people and they, they, they meditate on their pain and they go through the pain and they ruminate their pain and they think about their pain and they feel the pain and they feel sorry for themselves. But that just creates more pain. Sometimes we try and reinterpret the past and there are two ways to do it. You know, sometimes, you know, imagine if you have an argument with someone and it, you come off really badly from the argument. And so you go home really upset that you lost this argument and you were made to look foolish and you start talking to yourself and you start arguing with the person all over again. But this time the person is not there. You're just going over the conversation. And this time you're saying to them imaginarily what you wished you had said to them in the real conversation in order to try and convince yourself. That's what I meant to say instead of what I actually said. And those techniques don't actually heal. They just leave you in a, some kind of a sense of denial, trying to pretend that something else happened. What we need to do with the past is change the way the past has left us feeling about ourselves. So if the past experience left us blaming ourselves, it's my fault why this happened, then change that end result and start saying, it's not my fault that this happened. I was only a child. I was the victim. That person should have known better. They were in charge. I was looking to them for support. You know, and tell yourself that you have the right to be free and have peace and a clear mind and enjoy life. So the path to peace following healing opens up a whole new world. And what you focus on is what will grow. And if you have two plants, one plant is a set of weeds and one plant is a beautiful flower. The one you look after the most will grow the healthiest. So if you wallow in the past thoughts and recreate them, and you might think, well, I don't do that, but well, ask yourself, when I speak to my best friend, how often do I talk about bad experiences that I have gone through? How often do I talk about people that upset me when I'm talking to people? And every time you talk and you relive the emotions, you not only traumatize yourself all over again, but you are sharing the trauma with your friends. So they can be traumatized with you. So now the person that hurt you now is hurting two of you or three of you or four of you. So you, you go around carrying the very thing that hurt you and sharing it with other people. And that's how we keep reliving and feeding the weeds in our life. What we need to do is get angry. You might think, oh, what use is anger? Well, there's a specific type of anger that is useful, which sometimes jumpstarts our healing. 
It's when you get angry with the fact that you have allowed this person's behavior to, to harm you for so long. And you suddenly realize, you know what? For the last five years, I have allowed that one experience that that person has done, and they have probably forgotten about it now, to re-traumatize me every single day. You know what? You no longer have the right to hurt me over and over and over again. So you say to that thought that keeps traumatizing you, that keeps replaying like an endless record, you no longer have the right to hurt me over and over again. How dare you have so much power over me? If you speak to your negative thoughts like that, they will bring you very quickly into the present tense and you will suddenly realize what you are allowing that thought to do. You suddenly realize how many times you allowed that thought to replay in your mind and create all the same bodily sensations, the speeding up of the heartbeat, the perspiration, the anger, the acid in your stomach, all over and over again. And when you realize, actually, I have a choice. I can choose not to keep going over it again in that way and being the victim over again. Instead, I can choose to say something else about that experience. It wasn't my fault. I, I did not bring it upon myself. I am not to blame. And as you start to process these thoughts, you will start to feel the bodily sensations begin to change. One of the reasons why many relationships fail is because people who have hurt us, who have gone unpunished, linger in our minds, and we somehow don't feel satisfied until someone pays for what has been done to us. And so one person may have hurt us and they have moved out of our life and we have become oversensitive to that particular issue. So the next person that comes into our life, all they have to do is behave in such a way that reminds you of that other person's behavior. You don't have to copy them or be like them. Just do something that reminds you of them. And all the punishment that the other person deserved but got away with will now come upon the person that reminded you of them. And so, you know, your, your, your ex who upset you and provoked you or cheated on you or harmed you and got away with it, left all those angry feelings in you. And now the person that you are with, who is nothing like your ex, is now getting all the anger that your ex should have got, but got away with. And sometimes it's only when we realize that we are treating people unfairly, not because of who they are, but because who they remind us of, that we realize that we are not healed yet and we're still carrying around a lot of pain. Sometimes we realize that we are carrying pain because we lack empathy for others. You know, when someone tries to tell you about their pain, all that it does is reminds you of how much pain you have gone through. And sometimes you might even find yourself doing that. Instead of listening to their story, you jump in and tell them your story in the middle of their story because they have just triggered some unfinished business in your life. If you find yourself doing that, that is further evidence that there's stuff in your life that you haven't been able to heal yet. And you're just waiting to pour it out when you should be listening now you are you are speaking so how do you feel right now ask yourself am i suffering now and what am i suffering from and then say to yourself the experiences of the past have finished. So if you're still suffering now, you are not suffering from that experience. You are suffering from the bodily sensations that you used to experience when that was going on. And now the memory is triggering the bodily sensations. So if I, when I was small, you know, got slapped about the face until I burst into tears. And if every time I remember it, I burst into tears again, but yet no one has slapped me this time, but just the thought creates 
the end result, then I have a choice now that because the slapping has stopped, what I have is thoughts. If I keep thinking about it, saying, why did they do this? Why did they do this? I didn't deserve this and burst into tears. Then I am allowing the bodily sensations that occurred then to repeat themselves in the present tense. But if I stop and say something like, that should never have happened to me. The people responsible should have been stopped or punished. And I was an innocent victim. Now that statement produces a different set of bodily sensations. If you say, I am an adult now, and I would never do that to a child, that again produces different sensations. Even though you're talking about the same experience, you're now processing it in a different way. There are some false beliefs about healing that some of us may have, which may block our healing. Um, and let's look at some of them. I feel justified to stay in this hurt place because I was wronged. So because I was wrong, I have every right to feel this pain over and over and over again. That's a belief you need to be able to let go of. You know, another belief is, it is someone else's responsibility to make me stop feeling this pain. You know, someone else is supposed to, to help me now. And somebody else's responsibility to, to make up for what happened. You know, sometimes when our parents, for example, let us down when we were children, and we may never know the, the stress that they were on the, when they were trying to raise us. And you might somehow feel, you know, they messed us up. They did everything wrong. And now they've got to make it up to us. Somehow they have got to atone for their sins in order to make us feel better. And they may not even be able to do that because they may not even have understood properly how they had failed. Another false belief is concerning forgiveness. You know, this idea that if you forgive someone, it's like letting them off the hook, somehow approving of their behavior or you know, let, you know, excusing what they have done. But that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is allowing yourself to move on, whether that person was Ill, innocent or guilty. It's giving yourself permission to move on from the pain. If you say to yourself, it was so bad, that it is impossible for me to heal, then you are right, it will be impossible. So let me, let me share two passages of scripture with you, and then I want to hear your questions, and then we can discuss them. The first scripture is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, and it simply reads as follows, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So there are three things in the scripture. There's the fear aspect, there's the power, the love, and the sound mind, four things. So let's look at them. The fear says to you, the pain will never end. Fear also tells you this bad experience that happened to you is going to happen to you again and again and again. And God wants you to get away from that fear. Because if you don't get away from the fear, you will not be able to love and your sound mindedness will be blocked. You know, you no longer trust people so you cannot love them anymore with your whole heart because you can't trust. So because of the, the pain that you've experienced, you get trapped in fear. And if you get trapped by fear, you cannot truly love. And then the joy that, that you could experience that would enable you to move on, you block that joy because fear blocks love. And then the sound mindedness is really important because Trauma and pain causes us to depart from our sound-mindedness. So fear blocks our love and leaves us 
devoid of sound-mindedness. Let me give you an example of what I mean by an unsound mind. An unsound mind is somebody who fails to believe the truth about themselves or who actively believes a lie about themselves. So an example of somebody who is not of sound mind is somebody who says, I am stupid, you know, I am ugly. No one would ever love me if they really knew me. Nothing good ever happens to me. This is what pain projects onto our mind. Don't love anyone because you can't trust them. And this is who you are. Well, God says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So God wants to take the fear and replace it with power. And the power we're talking about is the power to change and the power to love again, to trust again. Not necessarily the same person because they may not be trustworthy, but to be able to love someone again and trust someone again. And the sound mindedness needs to return. So all those lies we believed about ourselves when we were being traumatized, we let them go. And then I want to look very briefly at understanding forgiveness. First of all, forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not overlooking the wrong or making excuses for other people's behavior. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not putting yourself back in harm's way. So because you forgive someone does not mean you must move back into a, a relationship where they can harm you again. Forgiveness is not allowing the offender to escape for justice. Some people believe if I forgive someone, then I shouldn't report them for what they have done because that means I haven't forgiven them. And some, some abusers even say that to their victims. If you report me, then that proves you, you, you are not properly a Christian because you haven't forgiven me. And, and that might sound really strange. Why would we be talking about Christianity in the middle of abuse? Because abuse happens even among people who know God. And so the fact that you have forgiven someone does not mean they must escape justice. Because when you report someone for what they have done, you, you are doing one of three things, or at least three things. Number one, you are protecting yourself from being harmed by them again. Number two, you are protecting other people from being harmed by them again. And number three, you are protecting them from having an opportunity to do to others what they have done to you. So justice is not always punishment. Sometimes justice is what that person needs. Sometimes to be found out and to be imprisoned or to have their privileges removed may be the very thing they need to change their own ways. So letting someone off is not a sign that you have forgiven them. You can forgive and still report for, for justice to be done. Forgiveness is not colluding with the offender to hide the offense. And forgiveness is not trying to forget that something ever happened. Because as we mentioned earlier, that is impossible. And now for our final scripture before we open for discussion. Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 32. And this is about Jesus when he was on the cross. And this is a, a statement that puzzled me for quite a while. It says, and there were also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right and the other one on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and cast lots. So there was Jesus on the cross. The soldiers had put him up on the cross. They had spat at him. They had mocked him. They had laughed at him. They had stripped him naked. And now they were at the bottom of the cross, casting lots for his clothes. And he looked down on them and said, Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. And I've often thought about that. And I thought, well, which part of what they did, did they not know? They knew that they put him on the cross. They knew that they spat at him. They knew that they laughed at him. They knew that they put the nails through his hands and how painful that might be. They knew they put the nails through his feet and how painful that was. They knew they stripped him naked and mocked him. And they knew they were casting lots for his clothes. So what was it that they knew not what they did? As I thought about it, I thought, what did they not know? And I thought to myself, well, they did not know how much Jesus loved them. They did not know that he was actually on the cross for their sins. They did not know what he had given up in heaven to come to this sin-darkened world to make this sacrifice. They didn't know how much he longed to save them. There was so much about what Jesus went through that they did not know. And when you forgive someone, there are two levels of forgiveness. One they are aware of, and the other they are not aware of. So if somebody steals your money, okay, they are aware that they stole your money. But what if as a result of that loss of money, you then go on to lose your accommodation and have to move into a terrible place with horrible people in a shared accommodation and have a terrible experience? all because you lost this money. And what if then you can't wear the clothes that you want to wear because you can't afford them and one of your relationships fail because you never turned up to a certain place because you weren't dressed appropriately. And as a result of not having the money, 100 unfortunate incidents happen in your life. Whenever you think about the person that stole your money, you will not just think about their act of theft, but the hundred unfortunate things that happened as a result of that loss. And all of them in your life is one terrible experience because they stole the, that money from you. But the thing is, they are aware that they stole money from you, but they may not be aware of the hundred other things that happened to you as a result of that loss of money. So if you're going to forgive them in your heart, the only way you will be free is if you forgive them for what they know that they did and then you forgive them for the pain that it caused you afterwards that they are not aware of. And when you forgive them for the second part, the ongoing inconvenience and pain and loss, which they are not, no longer aware of, then you become free. And sometimes we, we forgive people, we say we forgive them, but we only forgive them for what they did, but we don't forgive them for all the pain that happens as a result of what they did that they know not of. But when Jesus forgave the people at the foot of the cross, he not only forgave them for what they did, but he forgave them for the pain that what they did caused him, which they were not aware of. And then he was free and they were able to do whatever they did with no longer affecting him. Let me give you an example. Many years ago, when my children were young, I went through a time of financial hardship. And I remember one day when there was no food in the house, well, not enough to make a proper meal. But I went into the kitchen and gathered together whatever I could find to make a meal. And I, made, I managed to make a basic meal. And I gave the meal to my children. And I decided I am going to fast until I get paid, which was in a few days time. I just want to make sure that these children have something to eat. And so I gave them the food and they said, oh, we don't like this, we want something else, this is not nice. And they refused to eat it. And I went into another room to do something. When I came back, they had thrown the food away. Now, I was so upset. 
But 90% of my upset had nothing to do with the children. I was, I was upset, not because they threw some food away that they didn't like. I was upset because I had no money to buy any more food. I was upset because I had given up the food so they could eat it. And if they didn't want it, I would have gladly eaten it. I was upset because of the financial situation that I was in and all the mistakes that I had made. I was upset because now I had no more money to make any other food for them until a couple of days had passed. And all of that came upon me in that moment. And it was impossible for me to forgive them for what they did until I forgave them for all the pain that what they did had caused me, that they knew nothing of. They didn't know anything about my debts. They didn't know that I, I was unable to make any more food. They didn't know I was fasting in order to give them something to eat. All they knew was they didn't like the food and they threw it away. Now, when you think of that experience, everything that happens to you happens in two ways. It happens because someone does something to you and then the second part of the experience after the incident is over is what happens to you as a result of that experience, the ongoing pain, the ongoing suffering. When you try and forgive people, think about the two sides of the pain, the part that they were aware of and the part that they were not aware of. And ask God to help you to forgive them of both, what they know, and the part that they know not of. And when you are able to do that, then you will begin to feel relief from the pain, that pain that what they have done will stop sticking to you, it will stop repeating, and you'll be able to start stepping forward and moving away from it. So that's all we need to talk about by way of introduction. Let's talk to each other now. So switch your microphones on, um, and ask your questions or type them in the chat and Tashana will read them and we can discuss them. Okay. Thank you, Pastor, for that presentation. Now, um, if you want to ask, just put your hand up or unmute and ask the question. So don't be shy. Anyone? questions in the chat either. I haven't seen any questions so far. Mm. So it would appear then that um, maybe their questions have already been answered or they're still thinking about questions. What I will do is I will type into the chat my email address mm -hmm. because maybe the questions that someone of you may have may be private questions that you may not want to put on a forum, especially one that is being recorded. So I'll type in my email address, and then if anyone has questions that they want to discuss further, then you feel free to email me and I will answer them. So let me just type that in now. Okay. Anyone? Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, I don't have a question, but um, what you said there, it was beautifully said because I've been in a situation for a couple of years now where um, I'd give an example. So like my kid's dad, I resented him. I hated him for everything that he put me through for 10 years. And um, when I finally let go of that hate and the pain and I eventually forgave him from afar, I was able to build my relationship up with God. Mm -hmm. And I realized I felt so much better, like within myself. Like I just, it was just, it was, I felt like I wasn't carrying a burden no more, even though I wasn't with him. Mm. Um, when I finally let go and I just didn't care, it just, it was just a relief. And I felt, I felt, um, what's the word? I just felt great. I felt spiritually mm. blessed. Like I just felt great 
basically. And I've learned that if I can forgive someone as toxic as him, I can forgive anyone, basically. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And that's so true. That's so true. Thank you for that. Any questions, anyone? Hi, um, my question is, um, how do you really know that you have overcome your past hurts? Because oftentimes, you know, you, you go through a process of um, time and they say time is a healer, but then when you, you know, you, you may meet somebody else, etc., those fears start to creep they come to the surface mm -hmm. and you might find yourself sort of um trying to manage those fears yes. how do you really honestly know when you are in a good position to accommodate for somebody like in your life yes that's a really good question because many people remind us of other people in our life and so if you've had a bad experience with one person and then you meet somebody else and you think well I've got over that so I'm ready to move on many people have very similar behaviors that remind us of each other and you might think just when I thought I was over it this person reminded me of the pain and it all comes back as if it happened yesterday now there is one thing that you can do because one of the things that makes pain very difficult to manage is when you're trying to manage it by yourself. So if you're trying to build a new relationship with someone without needing to rehash every single past bad experience that you've ever had, if they do something or say something that causes you to suddenly feel the pain because it reminds you of what happened before, tell them. Because if you don't tell them what, what has just happened, they will see the reaction and not understand it. And then think something was wrong with them or something was wrong with you. When really the fault is neither you nor them, but just that something they innocently did trigger the memory that brought back an experience. So you can then see how strong or how worthy the next relationship is because when and old experiences triggered and you feel those experiences again, talk about them in that moment. And if that person can understand what happened and listen to your explanation and not take it all personally and recognize this is just an experience that you've remembered, that's a good sign. If you can relate to them in that way, then that may be a sign that the relationship has some depth and you can build on that. But if if the reaction causes them to react and your reaction causes them to have an overreaction and then when you try to explain it they don't want to know or don't care then that's a sign that their relation they're not deep enough to handle the complexities of your life or who you are so my first thing would be don't don't try and hide it because when you try and hide personal pains they bubble up in a different way anyway but when they are triggered just talk about them you know, the, you know, the thing that you said just now, I felt this, it's not because of you, but because of what happened, and this is what just happened to me, but it's not you. And let them understand, because people need to understand that they're not to, they're not to blame. It's not their fault that something has happened. And if they understand, then they will be part of your journey. They will join you and support you. So what, what feels like a bad thing, you know, the triggering of a bad experience, may actually be a good thing because it enables you to test the relationship and see is this relationship deep enough and stable enough to carry my whole life along with it so yeah well, thank you so much for that and uh, yeah I mean I you know my initial thoughts have been like um or maybe in the past I would have <laughs> I would have like not been very transparent about what I was thinking you know, it would have been maybe internalized, but um, I think probably throughout the last two years, 
I uh, strive to be a lot more transparent and it's and it's quite um, interesting that that was my challenge this week mm. you know mm. um, I had uh, somebody who I felt wasn't very honest with me uh, that this was like three years ago mm. it's not something recent yeah. and you know he, he just he wasn't mm-hmm. honest and um, I he had called me and um, because of uh, I had shifted in my thinking I was able to be in a position of power where I can challenge him and say look right now I need to actually stop and ask you to be honest. You're not being transparent. You're not being honest. Now, can you please be honest right now? You know, and mm-hmm. it's, it did stop him in his tracks. It really did. And I said, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't have any bad feeling towards you or anything. I just prefer that when we're having a conversation that we hold each other to account and then we we relate to people in an honest way. And I'm holding you to account right now. Mm. So can you please be honest? And he said, okay, yes, I will be honest. So I think, mm. you know, when you shift your thinking, it does hold people to account. And it doesn't allow them to, um, you know, do that to you yeah. in any way. Um mm. So I, I really do, um, you know, I'm so grateful that you actually said that. And, you know, there, that there doesn't have to be animosity. There doesn't have to be anger. Mm-hmm. It just really is the case of shifting your thinking yeah. and repositioning yourself um, so that you're able to, to do that. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, there's a question in the chat. Mm-hmm. It says, what if you what if you have never spoken to any of your family members about your abuse should I just leave it or not let it um not let it because cause any problem any tr- trouble and just learn to handle it by putting it to the Lord mm, yeah, so that's a very good question because a lot of abuse happens in families and secrecy is often what perpetuates the experience. And I can understand the dilemma, you know, thinking if I tell them now, one of two things may happen. One, they may be so traumatized by it that I may end up trying to get help for them because they're they're now suffering more than me. Or they may turn around and blame me and say, why didn't you tell us before? Some people do that when they're in shock. The first thing they do is say, why didn't you tell me before? And no matter when you tell them, they'll say, why didn't you tell me before? You know? And so it's a difficult decision to figure out whether to tell them or, or not. And I suppose you have to ask yourself a number of questions about why you want to tell them. Is it because you need their help in order to heal? Or is it because you need to protect other family members from that person who may be still at large and trusted by them and able to abuse other people? Or is it because you you feel that this person should should meet justice and they shouldn't just be getting away with this? And if they got some justice meted out to them, it might help them to change their own ways. So it would depend on on what your motives are for, for wanting to involve the family members. It would, you have to ask yourself, what outcome, what, what do I want from my family in response to this? Do I want them to give me um, support? Do I want empathy from them? Do I want understanding? Do I want an apology from them? Do I just want to warn them that this person who's in their midst is a dangerous person? So if you answer those other questions, then the question about whether to tell them um, will become clearer. And also, it would depend also upon their ability to receive this information. I don't know whether they are sick or elderly and what state they will be in if they receive this terrible thing. So all those questions would have to be asked by yourself before you decide, okay, yes or no, I I should involve them in this conversation, which they have not yet known. 
Okay. Hope that answers your question. If not, just um, put another question or be free to ask. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else? I did see Beverly on mute. Um, yes, Ms. T. Tom Tomo. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, um, you know, if you've ever been abused you, uh, and you're trying to get over it, that you'll never, you'll never forget it. But what will happen is that over a process of time, as you deal with it and handle it, that you, you can forget, but it's still there, but you handle it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Now, the abuser, you're saying that, that, <clears throat> that we'll never forget. So if someone abuse someone, the abuser. Yes. Do they, do, do, do they ever, do, do they... Do they remember? Because what I'm trying to say with this, someone abused some, a child years ago when they, when, when they were young, when they were seven years old. Mm. And, um, that abuser saying that they don't remember, can that be true or not? Because the, 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 the person that was abused knew that they were abused, mm -hmm. but now they're saying they don't remember. Can that be true? Or are they just blocking it out of the front or just, are they in denial that they did it? Some people, when they when they claim that they can't remember, are, are doing it for one of two reasons. One is they are, they are trying not to remember and they are, they are in denial, blocking it themselves. Another reason why they may say they cannot remember is because they don't want to face the consequences of, of admitting that they are guilty because the consequences might be quite serious for them. Um, unless they actually have amnesia or some um, <laughs> medical yeah. condition that damages yeah. their ability to remember, mm. they know. Because even things that you think you have forgotten, mm. if somebody reminds you about them, you remember them. Yeah. So, so that person could have forgotten about it during the time when no one mentioned it. But if it really happened and somebody reminded them of it, then they know it happened. They mm. haven't forgotten. They right. they have other reasons for saying that they they can't remember. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Because I had the same situation when I was a child. I was abused by an individual who lived in our house for a period of time. He, he left later on. And about 40 years later, about 35 years later, I spoke to him. I was now an adult, I'm married, I've grown up. And I said to him, do you remember what you used to do to me? And he looked me in the eye and said, I have no idea what you are talking about. But as I looked in his eyes while he was saying that, I could see terror mm. and fear in his eyes. Yeah. Mm. Because that conversation that I had with him took place very shortly after one of his friends had been put in prison for child abuse. And he knew that his friend had been put in prison for child abuse. And that abuse which had happened had happened 30 years earlier. And he knew that I could still at this late stage report it and put him in prison too. Mm. And so even while he was saying, I can't remember what you're talking about, I saw the terror in his eyes. Three years after that conversation, he called me and apologized. Mm. Not just for telling me he couldn't remember, but for what he actually did. So there are many reasons why people say they can't remember, but a genuine loss of memory is usually not one of them. Hmm. Any other questions? You can put it in the chat as we've discussed, or you can unmute and ask the question, so we'll give you some time to do that. Um, or any comments you wanna say anything? 
Sister Judith, you want to say something? No. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Anyone else? Is that it? Um, I think that it's easy. It's a lot easier to probably forgive, um, but to forget, you'll never forget it. Like and like we said earlier, say if you start a new relationship and you know, um, even though you know that you've forgiven that person, um, you you will never forget. I mean, you can watch something on TV, somebody can say something and them sour memories of the past will always get bought up. Whether you've mm. let go or forgiven that person or not, it will yeah. always happen. Um, say like, you know, being abused as a child. Um, yeah, you know, you have probably forgiven and you've moved on. It's something that you don't um, want to remember. But when you've got your own children then, you're still always going to have that fear in the back of your head. And, mm. you know, I don't think you ever fully let go because say if you have been abused, say if you leave your child at nursery or with someone, mm. yeah, you know, you have that trust in God. Um, you know, you want to cover them in the blood of Jesus every day and whatever, but you still have that fear inside of you. What if, what if, and you're always going to have that as a parent. Yes. You know what I mean? Um, exactly. So I think forgiveness and then forgetting are two different things because a lot of people say, oh, yeah, you can forgive, but you can never forget. And I think that is so true. Um, mm -hmm. But then a lot of people say, oh, but if you've forgiven somebody, then, you know, you won't think about it or you won't have certain feelings. But you can't really say that because, you know, it's, it's difficult. I mean, we're only human. And, mm -hmm. you know, I do think that, um, especially when you have come out of a toxic relationship and you want to go into another one, it is it is a scary thing because you are always going to think, what if? Yes, that's right. And you'd always be double protective to make sure certain things don't happen again. And you are, you are absolutely right because many people quote a so-called scripture, which, by the way, does not exist. I've heard people say to me, the Bible says you must forgive and forget. That is not true. There is nowhere in the Bible that we are commanded to, for, to forgive and forget in, at, in, the same, in the same way or at the same time. The Bible says that God will forgive our sins and he will cast them into the bottom of the sea and remember our sins no more. Nowhere in the Bible are we commanded to forget anything. And the reason is because our minds are not created that way. Our minds are actually created to remember everything that we have experienced. And even the things we think we have forgotten will be triggered anytime we have a similar experience. So the person who abused me when I was a child, that was about 42 years ago. I remember every single detail of what they did, even though I'm now 58 years old. But the difference between my memory now and my memory when I was younger and still traumatized is that I can remember the details without trauma. Mm. I know what happened. I have a clear record of what happened. If I have to give a testimony, I can accurately describe what happened but I have no trauma every time I think about it. I'm not upset anymore. My heartbeat doesn't race. I don't get angry. These are just facts that I am aware of, but the traumatic feelings have now gone. So don't try and forget something because that's like attempting the impossible. And don't let anyone say to you that you must forget in order to prove that you are forgiven because that's not true either. To forgive is to is to release, the, release yourself from the burden of what they have done. Mm. And even if you take someone to court because of what they have done, that does not mean you have not forgiven them because he, when God forgave David for his sins, God punished him afterwards. 
He says, your sin is covered. I have forgiven you. But the child that you had with Uriah's wife is going to die. That's the, one of the punishments. And punishment number two, the sword of trouble will never depart from your house. That's punishment number two. So he was forgiven, but he still had to live through the awful consequences of what he had done. So some people think if I forgive somebody, I mustn't, I mustn't uh, report what they have done. And then other people suffer because they are never found out. So you are right. Forcing yourself to forgive, I mean, sorry, forcing yourself to forget is not part of the forgiveness process. And also covering someone's sins and refusing to, to seek justice is not part of forgiveness either. You can seek justice and still forgive at the same time. Thank you. Joanna, you have your hand up. Joanna, you want to unmute? Sorry, my, my phone is so old. Thank you so much, um, Brother Paul. I'm not sure how to address you, but I- That's fine, always uh, really, fine, thank you. Brother Paul, I really appreciate what, what I'm hearing. And um, I know it's not easy to talk about at any stage of life, whether you had been recently hurt or decades ago hurt, like you said. But mm -hmm. I do appreciate, I wanna point that out where forgiveness is a matter of the heart. And mm -hmm. certainly we can, we can, through Christ's strength, forgive whatever we've been through. At the same time, I wanna point out, we have to be wise mm -hmm. in forgetting. You know, we mm -hmm. can be changed, we can be healed, but we cannot assume that the person who has so tragically hurt us is safe just because you have forgiven them. Absolutely, so, yes. yes. So forgiving, it, it benefits you. Yes. It benefits you. But I, I appreciate your whole message. It's very healthy and 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 wholesome and balanced. And praise the Lord that you have the healing that you have experienced through yeah. what you had been through. Thank you thank for sharing. You. Anyway, it's a very sensitive, sensitive topic. So thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, we're going to give you one more option, one more chance um, to ask any questions. And after that, we will close. Anyone else? Okay. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor Lyra. For, for this, it's, it's been eye-opening and also um, very, very interesting um, because it helps us to reflect on the way in which we um, deal with the hurts that have taken place. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, sometimes um, some of the hurts are, are yet to come. People may hurt us in the future. Mm -hmm. we, can use these tools to, to deal with those problems, um, God forbid, in the future mm -hmm. as well. So yeah. thank you, thank you for that. So thank what you. we'll, no problem. Um, we will now pray to close if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then that's it really. Um, mm -hmm. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the word that has been given to us today. By no means, um, the pain that we have gone through is not small. Um, however, um, often or whatever category of pain it is. But I know, Lord, that you see and you hear. And um, you said, revengeance is mine, says the Lord. So Lord, help us to cast all our cares upon you because you care for us. Um, help us to rest in your love and ask you to pour out your love within our hearts as we seek to gain the victories that Jesus has, has gained in his life. So thank you um, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 God bless you all. Amen. And Remember, I've left my email address in the chat. 
So if you need to contact me directly to ask any questions or further a conversation, feel free to do so. Thank you. So I'll say your email just for the, um, mm -hmm. for the video. It said it's P or lowercase P Liber, that's P L I B U R D at N E C Adventist that org dot UK. So that's P Liburd, L I B U R D at N E C Adventist that dot org dot UK. So that's it. Thank you, Thank Pastor. You. Thank you for your Bless you, everyone. Take God care. Take care. Have a lovely Thank you. God bless. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Judith.